So our speaker today, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce Uri Manor. Dr. Uri Manor is the director of the Wide Advanced Biophotonics Core facility here at the Salk Institute and has long been a champion of education outreach and the efforts at the Salk Institute. So we're very happy to have him. Uh, as our presenter today. His primary focus in the Biophotonics Core facility is the integration and application of optical and charged particle detection technologies to study problems of critical biological significance. So I'm sure Uri will be talking about this, but as a core facility, he works the facility works with all of the laboratories at the Salk Institute. So many different types of biological questions that can be addressed and answered, you know, partially through microscopy and microscopy techniques come into the advanced biophotonics core facility. So there's a lot of different types of problems that they work on there. Uh, URI's current research is focusing on developing artificial intelligence approaches to increasing the uh, breadth and depth of the microscopy techniques that they use. His main biological interests are mitochondria, hearing loss, neurodegeneration, and synaptic plasticity, which if you don't understand what that means, he'll be explaining that in his presentation. Uh, URI came before Coming to Salk, he did his PhD thesis research work with Bakara Kachar at NIH or through NIH and his postdoctoral training with Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz, NIH and Janelia Farms. And this is truly impressive. By the time he had completed his postdoctoral training, he had published 17 peer reviewed publications, which relied on his image and image analysis skills. So we are extremely pleased to have Dr. Manor as our presentation and Uri, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Donna, for uh, the lovely introduction. Um, I also want to thank all of the teachers for being here. My wife is actually a teacher. And I just want to say I know how hard and how much of your heart and souls you put into your work uh, any year, every year, uh, but especially this year. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that and thank you all for your time and for everything that you're doing, for helping us uh, all be better ancestors, as John Salk put it. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, all of, much of the imaging that we do in our core as um, basically the central imaging center of the Salk Institute. And I just want to point out real quick that um, this is obviously not, uh, this is a huge team effort. And many of those members, as you saw before, are here today to answer questions in the chat. Sandy Weisenovac, Pauline Wales, and Jane Fang, Tara Shiavon. But we do have other members who are not able to be with us today. So it's a really big team. It's an amazing team. It's probably one of the best teams in the world, if not the best. So I'm extremely grateful to have uh, such an amazing team uh, working with us. So I thought instead of talking about all of the microscopes and the imaging and how it works, it might be more instructive to talk about a case study. Why do we do imaging? Why would you ever want to put something under a microscope? And the reason is because if you can see how things are organized, how they're shaped, how they change over time or in different contexts, you can actually understand how they work. And as you all know, if you want to fix something, you need to know how it works. So in, in the context of biology, that means maybe we could even cure disease. And one disease I'm particularly interested in is hearing loss. So I'm going to do a case study and how we can use our eyes to understand our ears. And this is personal to me because I'm actually hearing impaired myself. And just to highlight how important hearing is, I hope you all appreciate. I mean, I know you have students who don't listen sometimes, but maybe, you know, even if they, if they couldn't even hear, it would be even worse. So Helen Keller, who was famously blind and deaf, uh, actually said that if she could choose one sense, either hearing or vision, she would choose hearing. And the reason is because she says blindness separates us from things, but deafness separates us from people. And again, as all teachers know, we are social animals. We learn from each other. We need to interact with each other to really grow and develop and survive as human beings. And one way I like to illustrate it is a little bit dark is one of the worst punishments you can impose on someone is to put them in jail, which is essentially isolation. And of course, you know, if you want to really punish someone while they're already in jail, what do you do? You put them in an isolation. 
So that just highlights the, the profundity and the impact of isolation, which is what deafness does to you. So we have a vested interest in understanding and treating hearing loss. So before I go into it further, you need to understand how hearing actually works. So you all recognize the ear over here. And then of course you recognize, most of you have been to a doctor's office, would recognize that there's this thing called the cochlea inside the ear that's famously shaped like a spiral. So this video is gonna show you how that works. So of course sound goes into the ear through the ear canal and then those air vibrations vibrate the so-called ear drum, which then vibrates the middle ear bones when that third middle ear bone over here then causes vibrations inside the cochlea. Now, if you unwrap the cochlea and look at it as a line instead of the cochlea, what we discovered is that it's actually graded and stiff. So it's actually looser on one end and stiffer on the other end. So that different frequencies vibrate at different regions of the cochlea. And this is a representation of what's happening in our ear right now. So this is one layer of organization in the biological tissue that gives us our frequency selectivity. Now, if you take a cross section of that long floppy thing that you saw, this is what it looks like. As it moves up and down, it causes these little hairs to move back and forth. And when they move back and forth, that actually stretches open a mechanosensitive channel that allows charged particles, ions, to move into the cell. And that's what sends an electrical signal to the brain which you can see represented here on the left. It becomes positive when it moves back and forth, and you can see that little pulse, and that's a nerve that actually goes all the way back to the brain. So that's how this works. And the reason they vibrate back and forth, I'm gonna come back to this, is because there's this structure on top that actually pushes these things back and forth as it moves up and down. So um, here comes our first microscope image. This is an image acquired by our lead electron microscopy specialist, Leo Andrade. So you can see here in the animation that there are three cells here moving back and forth and one cell here. And that's represented here. So you have these three rows of cells in green and then one row of cells in yellow. So each one of these here is one cell. And each cell has many hairs. They're called stereocilia that stick out of them. And those hairs are what are actually vibrating back and forth at the frequency of sound many thousands of times per second. And you can see they have this staircase shape where you have shorter rows and then a middle row and then a taller row and then a tallest row. And that's very important for understanding how this works. But in any case, this is what we call a scanning electron microscope image. And Sammy will talk a little bit more about that during the demo. Um, now, if you look across the tissue, I mentioned before that it's very stiff and tight on one end of the cochlea and really loose on the other end of the cochlea, and that gives us frequency selectivity. Well, it turns out there's another layer of organization on top of that to help us distinguish different frequencies, which is what we need to be able to make sense out of sound. So on one end, what we see using imaging again is that the hairs are much longer. And this is in the low frequency region. And on the other end, the hairs are much shorter, and that's in the high frequency region. So if you've ever opened up a grand piano and looked at the strings in the piano, you'll see that in the low frequency, the low pitch sound, the strings are really long. And if you look on the other end, they're really short. So our ear is organized in the same way. These little hairs are tuned to the frequency of sound that they're supposed to detect. It's pretty amazing. And again, I just wanted to show a higher magnification scanning electron microscope image to show us these little pip links that I mentioned before. So the shorter rows are connected to the taller rows by this little filament. And if you look really closely, you can see them here, connecting the shortest hairs to the taller hairs. And that's necessary for whenever they move back and forth to cause uh, these channels to open that it's basically like flicking on and off a light switch at the frequency of sound. And that's the signal that needs to get to the brain. So here's a different imaging approach called transmission electron microscopy, where we actually section the tissue into 70 nanometer sections. And Sammy will talk a little bit more about that again. But using that approach, we can get much higher resolution, even atomic level resolution. So using that approach, we decided to look at these hairs. And what you can see is this filament, again, that I mentioned before. And what this is, is two different cells. And in one, the cell is 
stimulated. It's on. And what that means is that string is really stretched tight and it's stretching open the channels in this shorter hair here. Whereas in this one, it's really relaxed and nothing's stretched, nothing's open, there's no signal. So here you can imagine is when sound is happening and here when it's not happening. And I just want to point out that if this shorter hair for some reason decided to grow longer and become taller, then this would become relaxed. On the other hand, if this hair here decided to grow shorter, this would suddenly become tight. And the point is that somehow biology has developed a method to tightly regulate this with nanometer precision so that this works. And you can see, imagine, the point is that if they become too long or too short, the whole system falls apart. So this is really remarkable organization, which again, you can only see with imaging. Another thing we can see with imaging is what happens in certain disease states. So there are three genes of many genes shown here that when mutated causes hearing loss in humans and in mice. And one of them is called EPS8, another is called Myo15A, another one's called Whirlin. The names don't really matter. But what's important here is that these are three different genes. And if you mutate any of them, then we see something similar happen to all of the hairs. What you can see here is that compared to the normal hairs, they're very short. And we know that all of them are, the, are very deaf as well. So again, something that we could only tell with imaging is why are they deaf? We wouldn't know unless we could actually put this under a microscope and look at what's going on with the hairs. And now we know they're too short. And we believe that the reason they're deaf is because they're so short, they can't touch that overlying so-called tectorial membrane. Um, so one way to measure that is again with imaging. So you can see the tallest hairs from each cell actually insert into, this is the tectorial membrane, and they form these little imprints where they insert in that overlying structure. So in a normal person or animal, we can see that. We can see the holes where they insert. And what we did was we looked at deaf animals and we saw that they don't have those holes anymore. Supporting this hypothesis that the problem is that these hairs are too short to actually reach the tectorial membrane, or at least one part of the problem. So to address this, we're using something called gene therapy, where we basically hijack viruses, much like coronavirus, but not exactly. And instead of delivering pathological replication uh, to the cells, We've hijacked them and we've engineered them so that instead they deliver a healthy copy of the gene that is missing in these deaf animals. And here you can see an example of what happens when we do that. So we've engineered this virus to infect those sensory hair cells in the ear. And what you can see is that the infected cell, the hairs are growing back. They're longer than the neighboring non transfected cells. And this is amazing. So the next question is, do these hairs actually contact the tectorial membrane? Can these animals hear? If yes, then we have a chance to take this to the clinic and actually start treating hearing impaired people like myself. Um, Sammy will talk a little bit about some other research we're doing where we use imaging to actually image something called the mitochondria, which are the powerhouse of the cell, as you all know. And one thing we're interested in is what happens during age-related hearing loss or noise-induced hearing loss, which we believe have similar pathways. And what we found is that before noise in normal conditions, the mitochondria are all over the cell. So these blue things are mitochondria, the yellow is the nucleus. Whereas after noise, all the mitochondria start to move towards the nucleus. So we're really interested in this phenomenon and what causes that and what happens next. Of course, we don't only image the ear. As um, Donna mentioned, and uh, as you all know, we're a biophotonics core, so we're imaging for everyone at the SALK. And the SALK is amazing. We have plant, we have cancer, we have metabolic research. So this is just a, a nice little highlight reel of different structures that we're imaging in the core that are not just the ear. And um, I'm going to kind of skip through. So we've got some blood vessels from a brain that we can image, and we can actually map out all the branches of each blood vessel in the brain to try to understand how that changes during disease. This was acquired during the Zika crisis, and we knew that the Zika virus actually remodels the branching of the vasculature in the brain. This is a cool example of how we can use that imaging to understand uh, what's actually going on. Um, we can also image the neurons in the cortex, so uh, that's what this is over here, color-coded for depth, 
So the closer it is to you, the more blue it is, the further away from you it is, the more red it is. It's a way to visualize the three-dimensional structure of um, brain in this case. And we can also image live animals in this case, this is a live worm that's being treated with a stimulus that sort of mimics a predator. And we can see which neurons turn on and off when a predator is present versus absent. So we can actually start to map the circuitry of these responses. And then we can actually start testing drugs to see whether they modulate that circuitry. Now, if we want to really see what's happening in the circuitry, we need to use something called electron microscopy. And then we can start looking at each synapse in the brain. So that's what we're looking at over here. This image was taken by Sammy Wise Novak. And here's the so-called presynapse, and here's the so-called postsynapse. And in the presynapse, you can see these circles. Those are presynaptic vesicles. And they carry neurotransmitters that when this cell becomes excited, let's say by sound, um, that's going to release vesicles that then cross, that merge with the membrane here and release the neurotransmitter that crosses the synapse. And then that activates the postsynapse. And that is the basis of the circuit, the basis of learning, and the basis of memory. So we're really interested in imaging these structures on a whole brain level. Now, I'm going to switch gears, sort of, to talk about artificial intelligence. Before, that was an image of natural intelligence. So now I'm going to show you a little bit about artificial intelligence. So in my other life, I'm a photographer, and I read photography blogs, and I came across this article that showed how you can use artificial intelligence to increase the sharpness and detail in photos. And I realized that maybe we could do this for our microscope images. Now, uh, artificial intelligence, and in particular deep learning, has been around for a while. And it's most famously been used for something called segmentation, which is where you take an image and you identify different objects. And the most famous example is self-driving cars. So on the left is what we call the input image. It's just a camera view of a street scene. And on the right is the output image that was created by human beings where they label different structures in that scene. For example, the street, car needs to know what that is, sidewalk cars, houses, trees. So the way artificial intelligence and deep learning works is you have input and output images. Output is so-called ground truth. And you teach this neural network, starts to learn by looking at many, many pairs of input and output, starts to learn the relationship between them, and it can start to be able to predict the output from any input, even if it hadn't seen it before. But this idea of using deep learning to create a sharper output from a blurrier input was newer to me. But um, I thought it would be useful for our microscope, and I'll explain why here. So if you look on the left, we're acquiring an image at low resolution, and on the right, at high resolution. And these little circles you hear are those presynaptic vesicles I was telling you about. Now, we would love to be able to image all of these vesicles in the entire brain. But if we image at the resolution on the right, it will take 160 years to image one mouse brain. On the left, it'll take 10 years. But of course, on the left, we can't see those vesicles. So this is a really nice example of the trade-off between imaging at low versus high resolution. So you can imagine that if we could image at the speed on the left, but get the results on the right, a lot of people would be really happy. So that's what we've done. If we trained a deep learning model to take these low resolution images, those blurry, noisy images on the left and convert them into the image that you see in the middle where now we can see those nice vesicles. And on the right, we took one reference image to show what, whether those vesicles are real or not. And it's not just making stuff up. And the answer is they are real. So we're very happy with that. And of course, we can also use it for live fluorescence imaging. So on the left is the live image of mitochondria and a cancer cell. And they're actually moving around the cell and merging and dividing all the time. But if you want to see that, you have to image with really high resolution. But the problem is then you're using a high-powered laser and you're cooking the cells. And now you're studying culinary science instead of biology. So instead, we decided we would image at very low resolution, low laser power. And you get the image on the left, which is pretty noisy and difficult to understand. And then we run it through our deep learning filter and you get the image on the right, which we can now understand. So that's very exciting. So I want to talk about one other artificial uh, intelligence example of image analysis that we're doing at Salk that I think you'll find exciting and interesting. 
So you um, heard mention of the uh, Harnessing Plants Initiative at Salk, where we're trying to figure out a way to make plants more efficient or to make more efficient plants to capture more carbon out of the atmosphere to fight climate change. As it turns out, one of the best ways that plants capture carbon is in their roots. The roots are very carbon rich. So to understand, um, to, to capture more carbon, we would love to have more elaborate and better and more efficient root systems. Of course, roots are also important for surviving in a climate change world. If you want to deal with, um, you know, drought or excessive heat, uh, roots are very important. So we have a vested interest in understanding how roots are organized. So to do this, in collaboration with the Bush Lab, we've developed this robot that can image thousands and thousands of root systems from many different plants from all over the world or from different genetic variations. So now we can get images of these different roots and start to understand how plants make better or worse roots. But to understand it really, we need to convert these photos into diagrams like this, where we can actually measure the length of the roots and the properties of the roots. Now Wolfgang has developed a method using computers that can convert these images into numbers. And it's called BRAT, which is a wonderful name. Um, the problem is that it doesn't work so well once you start dealing with more complicated roots, which are the roots that we want to study. And I mentioned before, artificial intelligence has been really successful for being able to interpret images, for example, in the case of a self-driving car. So we literally took almost the exact same algorithm that was used for self-driving cars and applied it to these images of roots to see if we could train it to detect everything we need to detect. So here's an example. On the left is the BRAT result, and on the right is the artificial intelligence result. And every time you see a red dot here, that's a successful analysis. So you can see it's much better than the previous generation. So it's just a great example of the success of artificial intelligence. So here's another example. Here's the raw photo from our robot. And here's the ground truth, which importantly was generated by humans. Humans looking at the image. We've got amazing brains, amazing eyes. So we can look and we can say, yes, that's definitely a root over here. And we can draw with a mouse or on a touch screen where the roots are. And then on the right, you can see the prediction of our artificial intelligence, which you can see is very good. But to get better, we need more data. So we developed a citizen science crowdsourcing site on Zooniverse where people, high school students, for example, um, can look at these images on the computer and they can help trace these images, which gives us data that we then feed to our artificial intelligence engine to get better and better at this. And as we get more and more data, we're gonna need more and more help. And eventually we'll have a super powerful AI, artificial intelligence, that can work for all of the images we ever get again. So I invite you all to help us out with this effort and spread the word and um, check out the link over here where you'll be able to find all the instructions on how to do it and how to contribute. And with that, I just wanna thank um, a really long list of supporters and collaborators and thank you all for your attention and I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, for the teachers, we do have a link to the crowdsourcing website that Uri was referencing, so you will have access to that later. If you would like to unmute yourself, you're welcome to use the hand raise feature or you can type your questions into the chat. And while teachers are typing, I would be happy to kick it off. Can you talk a little bit about um, maybe something teachers did to nurture your love of science or on the flip side, something that they did that discouraged you at some point? Me? Okay. Um, well, I mean, throughout my life, um, teachers have always been so inspiring and supporting. As I mentioned, I, was, I am hearing impaired. And I actually I had a much more difficult time hearing when I was younger than I do now. Even though my hearing is technically getting worse, my brain is getting better at filling in the gaps of what I don't hear. But when I was younger, I really suffered a lot. And I had a whole team of teachers who worked with me and, um, you know, really helped me stick with it. And all the way up to grad school, I had teachers helping me um, 
believe in myself when I didn't. And um, I, I'll never forget that. And in terms of teachers not helping, I think the only thing I can say specifically was um, I didn't like biology, ironically, when I was a high school student. And it was, I think, a large part because of the textbook, but there was so much memorization that I didn't know why I had to memorize every molecule in the Krebs cycle or all of these things that we were being tested on that really killed. I, I never understood just how interesting it, and powerful it really was. So that was that was something that I had to recover from. Obviously, I have because now I'm doing biology, but it took a long time for me to recognize the beauty of biology. So if I had to choose one, that would be it. I see a ton of questions in the chat, but I don't know where to start. It looks like um, people are doing a really good job of responding. How long has it taken me to reach this point in my research? Well, I'm 41 years old, so that's one answer. But uh, I, let's see, I graduated high school when I was 17, and then it, it took me some exploration. I, I was a bartender for a while. Uh, dropped out of college, you know, spent three or four years um, doing damaging things to myself and then uh, realized I didn't want to be a waiter or working in the restaurant business for the rest of my life. And I wanted to do something with my brain. So I went back to college. And when I went back, I was so excited to learn. I, was, I felt so grateful to have access to all this knowledge and this information. And I think it was good for me to take that time off to mature and, and really recognize um, how what a gift it is to be able to learn this advanced knowledge. And then from then on, it was a straight path to what I am now, straight from college to grad school to postdoc here at the SOC. Can I ask a quick question about all the collaborations you have at the SOC and how, how you came to the SOC and why you feel it's such, I, at least I, feel it's a really unique um, place to be so it really is it's an amazing place and anytime I ever go visit some other place you know to give a seminar or whatever I'm always so glad to come back to the salt it's truly magical and uh, one thing you know Madison mentioned in the beginning there's a really unique architecture of salt and I never really appreciated or believed how much architecture affects your mind your emotions and your spirit, and in this case, an institute, until I was at the Salk. So the amazing thing about the Salk that I think no other place has is, ironically, how small it is. It is really small. There are fewer labs at Salk than some of these big name universities like Harvard or whatever have in its single department. So there might be departments at other universities that have more labs at Salk, all studying one thing. On the flip side of the salt, what we have is a combination of small but powerful or really high caliber. So we might only have a small handful of plant biologists, but they're the best in the world. We might have only a small handful of neuroscientists, but they're the best in the world. And they're all interacting because the place is so small. So you might get a neuroscientist talking to a plant biologist about branching. I showed you that image of blood vessels in the brain branching. That's the same thing that roots do. And it turns out some of the same mathematical principles work for both of them. And there are ticks, there are, sorry, tips and tricks and tools that were developed by plant biologists that neuroscientists would never have been aware of, but they can use them and vice versa. So these common principles in biology, in nature, in mathematics can now be leveraged by having this nice interaction in this small place between all of these world-class scientists. And there's no other place in the world I've been to that does anything close to that, where you have the breadth and the depth. So as a core director who collaborates with all of these people, for me, it's just like, it's almost too much. It's like overstimulation of amazingness. I get to see all of it and work with all of it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Thanks, Uri. You did a great job on how we all feel about this talk. So I appreciate it. <laughs> sure. 
Sure. Thank you. I, I have another quick question. Is there any uh, new technology or any other tools that we don't have at Salk that you would like to see us acquire? That's a really bad question. <laughs> because of course there are. Um, I'm, a, I'm a technophile. Um, I've explained to people, you know, my hearing aids, I wouldn't be where I was if it wasn't for hearing aids, right? So I have a direct personal connection to how tools really make life a better place and um, allow us to do things that we couldn't do before. And of course, there's always, just like computers, every year there's a newer and better version coming out. And, you know, I, I, when I came here, I bought a bunch of new microscopes. At the time, they were cutting edge. That was five years ago now. So there are new cutting edge microscopes that I would love to have at Salk. The problem, of course, is that they're expensive. Um, you know, like one microscope is a million dollars or between a million and $10 million. So that's why we don't have them yet. <laughs> but yeah, there's new kinds of electron microscopes that would give us better resolution to be able to resolve things like synapses uh, a little bit better or mitochondria. There are certain fluorescence microscopes for live imaging that are faster and higher resolution that we don't have yet that I would love to have. Um, those are the two key things and a couple other smaller toys that would be nice to have as well. So if anyone's playing the lottery, you know, keep us in mind. Uh, someone just asked if I collaborate with other researchers out of Salk. Uh, yes, many, many, many. Um, the majority, the mo you know, outside of Salk, most of our collaborators are at UCSD just by virtue of proximity. It's easy for them to bring us samples. But we also collaborate with people at Janelia Farms, uh, in Berlin, in Israel, in China, in Japan. Um, and the things like artificial intelligence are a great place for collaboration because all you need is the data. So we can send them computer code via email. We can send data via file transfer online. So there's really nice ways now that we can collaborate with people all over the world and we do. All right, is there any final questions? Oh, yeah, uh, we can answer both. So two questions. So are, there, are other labs using viral vectors to help with hearing? Yes, we're, we're definitely piggybacking on a lot of hard work done by other labs. Uh, most famously at Harvard, there's a, a couple key labs there that have been working hard to develop these virus methods that are much more efficiently targeting the inner ears. But of course, as I showed you in that one slide, there's three different genes that cause the same thing to happen. There are even more genes than that. So no one else is working on the specific gene that we're working on, but other people are working on similar methods for other genes. Um, someone asked if there are a library of these images available to teachers. First of all, we're happy to make available any and all of the images we showed and more uh, if anyone wants to use those. Also across the street at UCSD, there's something called the National Center for Microscopy Research, NICMIR, N-C-M-I-R. And they have something called the Cell Image Library, which is really worth checking out. It's a collection of many beautiful high resolution images of many different types of cells and structures and cells. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. I know I definitely learned it's, I think when you can, the idea that we can visualize hearing is an interesting concept, and I think it is really important. So thank you so much for sharing your passion with us this morning.